In the early hours of December 28, 28, 39-year-old Lucky Shima was rushed to West Middlesex Hospital with a bewildering set of symptoms. He was disoriented, struggling to remain conscious, and his vision was severely blurred. On top of that, he was plagued by uncontrollable bouts of vomiting. The perplexing combination of symptoms immediately pointed towards some form of poisoning, and doctors knew that time was of the essence. To save Lucky's life, they first needed to know what he had been poisoned with. While doctors rushed to save his life, investigators were more focused on whether Lucky was the unfortunate victim of an accidental poisoning or if something more sinister was at play. Today's case takes place in Southall, West London, England. Southall is a rich tapestry of South Asian immigrants from countries such as India and Pakistan, who have been immigrating to the area since the mid-19s. To appreciate some of the themes in this case, it's important to first understand the culture surrounding marriage and caste in Indian culture. India's caste system is a deeply entrenched social hierarchy with roots going back thousands of years. Think of it as a social system that divides people into four main groups, although there is also a fifth group, commonly known as the untouchables. This isn't just a historical structure. In fact, as recently as the 1980s, the caste system played a significant role in fostering social and economic inequalities in India. A person's caste can dictate almost every aspect of their life, from the profession they're allowed to pursue to who they can marry and even the social circles they're permitted to join. The impact of this division is severe, particularly for those in lower castes, who often find themselves marginalized and subject to discrimination. The caste system feeds heavily into the culture of arranged marriage, by arranging for your child to marry someone in a higher caste, you can significantly improve their career prospects and provide financial security. The concept of arranged marriage is often misunderstood or misrepresented to Westerners. In more recent times, the arrangement usually occurs between two consenting parties, and while movies and TV shows might have you believe that the bride and groom meet at the altar, the reality is that most couples spend time together before the actual wedding to ensure they are a good fit for each other. That being said, there are absolutely situations where two people don't have a choice in their partner. Whether choice is involved or not, it doesn't necessarily determine whether the partnership is going to last. But that's not too different from Western culture, where many marriages end in divorce despite both parties consenting at the time of their marriage. With that context in mind, let's get into today's case. Lakvinder Shima, known as Lucky to his friends, moved to the UK as a teenager to enter into a marriage that had been arranged by his parents. The arrangement was short-lived, and by the mid-1990s, the couple had separated. Divorce is uncommon in Sikh communities, but given that Lucky was still young, his family hoped that there would be time for him to remarry and start a family. To help him get back on his feet, his sister Narinder offered him a place to stay at her family home in Southall, UK. At the time, Narinder lived with her husband, Varinder, and their kids, as well as Varinder's brother and his wife, Lakbir. It isn't uncommon for Indian families to live under the same roof as their extended families, and it suited Lucky well. He was a family guy through and through, and he enjoyed spending time with his nieces and nephews in between his work at Rent-A-Kill Initial, an international pest control company. He was regarded as an easygoing person, and his friends and colleagues remembered him as someone with a good work ethic and a friendly smile. As well as being an uncle, Lucky also enjoyed spending time with his sister-in-law, Lackbeer. The two were the same age, and they seemed to have a lot in common. But it wasn't long before their relationship took a different turn. You see, Lackbeer was in an unhappy marriage herself. Her husband was 17 years older than her, and their partnership had been arranged by their parents when she was a teenager. By the time Lucky moved in, she had been in the marriage for a decade, in what she described to Lucky as a loveless relationship. But while Lucky had chosen to separate when things weren't working out with his wife, Lockbeer chose a much more destructive and ultimately fatal route. She initiated an affair with Lucky, which lasted 16 years. There were two parties involved in the relationship, and both Lucky and Lockbeer were responsible for their choice to carry out the affair while one of them was married. Once the affair began, it heated up rapidly. Within a couple of months, Lucky was ready to buy his own place, which meant the pair had somewhere more private to carry out their liaisons. Their affair wasn't only sexual. Lackbeer visited Lucky's home every day. While she was there, 
She did his washing and cooked and cleaned for him. If you didn't know their history, you would easily assume that Lucky and Lackbeer were the ones who were married. In the years after the affair began, Lackbeer and Lucky got pregnant twice. Each time, the pregnancies were terminated for fear of bringing shame on their families if their relationship was discovered. Lackbeer already had three children of her own to consider, and it seems that the shame and disapproval were what Lucky and Lackbeer feared the most. According to a close confidant of Lucky, Lackbeer talked about leaving her husband a couple of times, but each time she discussed it with Lucky. He encouraged her to stay so she wouldn't be cast out by the community or their family. The relationship was a secret from everyone except the boarders Lucky had living in his house to help pay the expenses. As for Lackbeer's husband, there's little evidence to suggest that he was aware of the relationship between his wife and Lucky. This is largely because he spent a lot of time away from the family home due to having cancer, which meant he regularly traveled between the UK and India for treatment. Even when he was home, he spent days or weeks in bed as he recovered from the procedures. Even though the affair between Lucky and Lackbeer lasted 16 years, it wasn't always happy. Over time, the pair began to drift apart, mostly because of the temporary nature of their partnership. Things got even more challenging for the pair when rumors about their affair reached their extended family members. Around the same time, Lackbeer's husband passed away from cancer, leaving Lackbeer free to make her relationship with Lucky official. By then, Lucky was 39 years old, and he decided he wanted more than what Lackbeer could offer. He wanted a wife who could give him children of his own, and his family agreed that he should find someone who was a better match than a widowed mother of three. In 2008, he met 21-year-old Gurgit. Gurgit was an acquaintance of his sister Narinder, and almost immediately, the pair hit it off. By October of that year, Lucky had formally proposed marriage, and two weeks later, their engagement was announced to family and friends. They set the date of their wedding for February 14th, 29 Valentine's Day. Now, all Lucky had to do was let Lackbeer know the relationship was over. Easier said than done. Lucky broke the news that he no longer wanted to be with her and that he was promised to someone else. He gave a few details about Gurgit including that she was much younger and that he wanted to have children with her. That should have been the end of it, but for Lackbeer, it was simply the beginning of a downward spiral into jealousy and obsession. Lackbeer struggled to come to terms with the fact that Lucky didn't want to be with her anymore. Separating from someone after 16 years is undoubtedly emotional and difficult, but it was made even worse by the fact that she couldn't talk to anyone about it. Their affair had been a source of shame and guilt, so it wasn't as if she could lean on her family members to help her through. She was also meant to be mourning her dead husband, not trying to marry someone she had been cheating on him with for 16 years. On top of that, Lucky had All of that ignited a jealous rage in Lackbeer. What she did next would have lethal consequences. For the next few weeks, Lackbeer continued to message Lucky as if nothing had changed between them. Then she started to try and convince him to cancel the wedding and break up with Gurgit. When that didn't work, she told Lucky that Gurgit only wanted him so she could get UK citizenship. Then, Lackbeer started spying on Lucky and Gurgit whenever they were together. On one occasion, she peeped through the window while they were in bed together. She then rang Lucky and told him that if she ever saw them sleeping together again, she would burn his house down. Eventually, Gurgit reached out to Lackbeer directly. She hoped that she could convince Lackbeer to get over Lucky, but the conversation only seemed to make Lackbeer angrier. Despite the constant harassment, Lucky never budged on his commitment to Gurgit, or at least that's what he told her. Unbeknownst to Gurgit, Lucky had been playing both women. When he first made his commitment to marry Gurgit, his intentions seemed genuine. But over time, he softened. And before long, he was continuing his affair with Lackbeer. When he was with Gurgit, he told her everything was over between them, and that Lackbeer was just a jealous ex who needed to move on. In November 2008, three months before Gurgit and Lucky's wedding day, it looked like Lackbeer had finally taken her lover's advice. She booked a trip home to India, and the calls and messages stopped. Everything was going well until three days before Christmas in 2008, when Lucky was admitted to the hospital after complaining of severe stomach pains. 
Because of his unique symptoms, doctors suspected he had ingested some type of toxin, but there was no way to identify exactly what that might have been. Thankfully, the treatment he was given seemed to help, and he made a full recovery. But he wouldn't be so lucky the second time. Two weeks before his wedding date, Lucky was admitted to the hospital again. He had just finished sharing an evening meal with Gurgit, where the pair had been discussing wedding plans. But when Gurgit went to take a shower, Lucky began to complain that he could not feel his face, and his vision was going blurry. An hour after those symptoms first appeared, he lost complete control over his arms and legs. By then, Gurgit was also beginning to experience similar symptoms. Finally, in the early hours of December 28th, they called an ambulance. But for some reason, the ambulance never arrived, and Lucky's sister and her two sons came and took them both to the local hospital. During the car ride, Gadget tried to reach out to hold Lucky's hand when she realized she, too, was losing control over her body. By the time they reached West Middlesex Hospital, Lucky and Gurgit's condition was life-threatening. They were both vomiting, and neither of them was able to stand without assistance. When heart and blood pressure monitors were attached to Lucky, the medical staff noticed that he had a very unusual cardiac rhythm. Within minutes of arrival, he was unconscious. Doctors immediately suspected that Lucky had ingested some type of toxin, but just like the last time, they had no way to identify exactly what that toxin might be. They ran every blood test they had available, but all the results were inconclusive. While doctors scrambled to pinpoint what had caused Lucky's symptoms, he continued to deteriorate. As medical personnel performed CPR, his sister became increasingly hysterical and was asked to leave the room. Despite their best efforts, at 2.36 am, Lucky passed away Narinda and her son were notified of Lucky's death in the waiting room of the hospital. On the other side of the hospital, Gurgit was barely clinging to life. Treatment after treatment was pushed directly into her bloodstream until, finally, she appeared to respond positively. For two days, she was suspended in a medically induced coma until doctors felt it was safe to bring her back to consciousness. Medical staff had still not been able to identify what made the couple sick, but they were extremely concerned that they might have been the victims of a biological or radiological attack. For this reason, they notified the police about Lucky's strange death and Gurgit's illness, hoping that when Gurgit was well enough, she might be able to shed some light on a possible cause. Sure enough, Gurgit was able to tell them that she and Lucky's last meal together was a leftover curry they had prepared the night before. She also explained that she only had one serving of the leftovers, but Lucky had gone back for seconds. Did this explain why Lucky's symptoms had been fatal while Gurgit had survived? But if the curry was to blame, there was at least one question that needed to be answered. What could they have cooked into a meal that could cause such devastation? To answer that question, investigators needed to identify what the toxin was. With support from the National Poison Information Service, they requested highly specific samples to be taken from Lucky's remains. They also ran a broad range of blood tests on Gurgit. It's here where forensic botany began to play a role in solving this case. Forensic botany plays a crucial and fascinating role in solving crimes. Not only can plants help identify the location where a body was discovered or where a criminal act occurred, but they can also indicate how they were used as a possible instrument of death. That's exactly what they found in Lucky's case. Lucky and Gurgit both experienced a range of typical symptoms associated with poisoning, such as vomiting, loss of consciousness, and strange body sensations. But what set their case apart was what happened to their hearts. Both victims developed multiple arrhythmias, which is when the heart beats out of time. For Lucky, these unusual rhythms caused his heart to stop pumping blood completely, leading to cardiac arrest. Whatever he ingested effectively stopped his heart. While this was a shocking discovery, it was also a very clear indicator of what could possibly be the culprit. There are very few known toxins that cause the heart to beat erratically. By running additional tests on Gurgit as the sole survivor, forensic botanists were able to name the toxin as aconite. Aconite wreaks havoc on the nervous system when ingested, leading to symptoms like vomiting, heart irregularities, and loss of consciousness. Its most deadly component is aconitine, which interferes with the body's ability to send electrical signals between nerve cells. If no signals get through, then the function stops completely. 
The toxin only takes a few minutes to take hold of the body completely, and there's no known treatment to reverse the effects. Aconite is sometimes referred to as the queen of poisons. But where would Lucky and Gurgit get hold of something so deadly? You might have heard of a plant known as monkshood or wolfsbane. The flower of the plant is often cultivated for its stunning blue to dark purple bloom. But those beautiful petals harbor a dangerous secret. Wolfsbane is home to several deadly toxins, one of the most lethal being aconite. Sure enough, when the investigators took a closer look at the couple's home, they found traces of aconite in the curry they had consumed in the hours before Lucky's death. But if the couple had made the curry together the previous night, then why did they only fall sick after they ate it the second time? The first lead in answering this question came when officers interviewed a boarder who lived in Lucky's house at the time of the incident. The lodger told officers that the fridge was communal, and that anyone living in the house could have taken a sneaky taste of the curry. Did that mean there was a chance the poison had been intended for someone else? Then the lodger told officers how, on the day of the poisoning, she had seen Lucky's ex-lover, Latoya, enter the house using a spare key. She had watched as Latoya went into the kitchen and took the curry out of the fridge. She hadn't seen what Latoya did next, but it didn't take much to put two and two together. On top of that, the lodger mentioned to the officers that after the first hospitalization, Lucky had asked her to watch his back and only let family enter the house, not friends. His lodger also suggested changing the locks, but Lucky never got around to it. With the eyewitness statement putting Latoya and the deadly curry together, Officers immediately launched a homicide investigation, and a search warrant was issued for LaToya's house. Inside a coat and a handbag taken from her home, officers found bunches of herbs. When these samples were tested at the forensic lab, they were identified as a type of aconite-containing plant. Not only that, but this particular variety was also native to India. Now there was a so-called murder weapon and a suspect. All officers needed to establish was a motive. That was perhaps the easiest aspect of this investigation. It was clear that Latoya struggled to let go of her relationship with Lucky, even when it was clear he had moved on. Her actions leading up to Lucky's death were increasingly alarming. She stalked him and his new partner and made threats against them both, suggesting a growing desperation or obsession. And there was something else. During the investigation, officers learned about the previous incident where Lucky had been admitted to the hospital with suspected poisoning. Gadget was able to confirm that the last thing Lucky ate before that incident was a meal Latoya had prepared for him. She had tried to kill him once, and when that didn't work, she struck again. And this time she went for both Lucky and the woman who was set to replace her at his side. It is also clear that in Lucky's final conscious hours, he suspected that his symptoms had been caused by his ex-lover. When he first began to feel sick after eating the curry, he called his lodger and asked for her help. When the lodger asked if Lucky's girlfriend had done this to him, he said yes. While he was on the phone with paramedics, he said, On the 31st of January, 29, Latoya was charged with Lucky's murder and the attempted murder of Gurgit. She was also charged with the attempted murder from the earlier poisoning incident prior to Christmas. She pleaded not guilty to all charges. The prosecution argued that Latoya was a killer. They used the bag and jacket, which contained the deadly wolfsbane, as well as testimony from the lodger who saw Latoya touching the curry just before the poisoning, as their main arguments. They also showed evidence that Latoya had returned from India just a week before the first poisoning incident. They argued that the purpose of this visit was to get hold of the deadly plant that was used to murder Lucky. A month after LaToya returned from the trip, Lucky was dead. When it came time for the defense to present their case, they used the matter of the ongoing affair between Lucky and LaToya as the centerpiece of their argument. Gurgit had been unaware that the affair had continued long after her marriage with Lucky was planned. In court, defense lawyers had read out loud text messages between the pair, which made it clear the relationship was anything but over. Gurgit told the court that Lucky had promised her that the relationship with LaToya had ended three years prior to them starting to see each other. She became tearful when she realized that the messages meant that while they were courting and making plans for marriage, her fiancé was cheating on her with LaToya. The defense used Gurgit's vulnerability as a foundation for their main argument, that LaToya wasn't the killer at all, but they knew who was. They named Lucky's brother-in-law, Varnder, as the actual killer, 
They argued that he had killed Lucky because of the shame that would be brought to their family because of the affair with Latoya. To further prove their point, the defense introduced evidence that showed Varnder had called Gurgit hours before she was poisoned. On the call, he had threatened, I am going to cover my hands with Lucky's blood, and only then will my aggression and anger calm down. On top of that, Lucky's nephew told officers that right after Lucky died in the hospital, he had been told by family members not to inform the police about the affair and the poisoning, as it would bring shame to the family. Latoya refused to testify in her own defense, and on the 10th of February, 2010, she was found guilty of the murder of Lucky and of grievous bodily harm to Gurgit. She was also found not guilty of attempting to murder Lucky in December 2008. She received a sentence of life imprisonment with a minimum term of 23 years. Latoya's actions and the affair between them caused a deep divide between the two sides of their family. Lucky's brother-in-law and many family members did not turn up at his funeral, and their estrangement continues to this day. In more recent years, medical botany has come to the forefront once again in relation to a poisoning case in Australia. In that case, a woman is suspected of feeding deadly poisonous mushrooms to four family members. This incident resulted in three deaths, while a fourth person remains in critical condition and requires a liver transplant. The woman has not been charged with any crime, and the investigation is ongoing. Thanks for joining me to untangle today's complex case. If you found yourself gripped by this case and you're as eager as I am to dig deeper into others, there's a simple way to make sure you're in the loop for future episodes. Just hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. This way, you'll be among the first to join us on our next journey into the criminal mind.